Father God, just for today, help me walk your narrow way. Comes the time we have to say so long, and then she'd tug on her ear. And I don't know, maybe it just seems that way to me, but it seems like we just got started. And before you know it, here comes the time it is to say, at least so long for now. And uh, an ordinary gospel meeting is uh, Sunday through Wednesday, six messages. And it's been my privilege to deliver nine uh, since Wednesday night. This will be the ninth one. And uh, so this has been a little longer meeting, but it does seem to have gone by rapidly. Uh, and I have appreciated very much your hospitality. Uh, when I was a little boy, I wanted to be a preacher. My mom was not yet a Christian. My dad would take us to services. We'd come home, and my mom says I would go in my room and line up all my G.I. Joes and Army men and whatever I could find and start preaching. She said, you were screaming in there. I don't know why that would have been the case because our local preacher in Elmwood, Illinois, wasn't a screamer when he preached. I think when you're a little boy, it just seems like the preacher's yelling. I like that story I heard about a Bible class teacher that said to the little boy in Bible class, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a preacher. Oh, that is fantastic. Tell this, tell this class why you want to be a preacher, young man. He said, well, the way I got it figured... I'm going to have to be at services anyway. And it seems like it'd be a lot more fun to stand up and yell at people than to be one of the ones being yelled at. I want to be a preacher when I grow up. I don't know any gospel preacher who thinks of his work as standing up and yelling at people. I think it just seems that way when you're the, the little boy. But this other little boy in the class was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be the visiting preacher. Now, he's smart. He is a smart cookie. I've been both. I've been the local preacher standing with our visiting preacher during the gospel meeting and have heard members tell him they hadn't heard a sermon on that since, and I'm thinking since three weeks ago. But I'm the guy that's been here so many years you forgot that I preached on it. And so, look, I never let your kind words go to my head because I'm smart enough to know if you had to hear me week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out for 17 years almost, like they did in South Haven, Mississippi, uh, your comments would be greatly tempered, I'm sure. Uh, 663 mile journey tomorrow to my house will, uh, uh, you know, go quickly as I think about all the memories that uh, I've enjoyed in just this short time with you. What does the future hold? I am not the prophet or a son of a prophet, as people used to say, but there are some things I know for sure about the future. And it's not because I have any special knowledge that no one else possesses. In fact, as you remember, our whole theme this week has been back to the Bible. Now, as I go back to the Bible, it gives me the information that will then prepare me for my future. I get the info in here that I need to be able to map out and plan out my future. What is coming in your future and mine? Look, these are just realities. They're not something that any of us necessarily enjoy lingering over, but they have to be addressed from time to time. What does the future hold for me? Well, number one, I know that there will be death in my future. I know this because Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. I know this because in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 2, David was getting ready to die, and he said to Solomon, I go the way of all the earth. It's a universal situation. The obituary page is always going to have someone on it. When I was growing up, I was in the school spelling bee, and I was able to do well enough in the school spelling bee to win in advance to the district and regional, ended up in the city finals, 
with 24 other spellers. And this kid sitting next to me, right next to me, right before the competition began, he said, I hope you win. And what I wish so much that I had said was, thank you, good luck to you too. But what I said was, so do I. Not a good thing. Pride goes before a fall, doesn't it? Haughty spirit before destruction. I was a little too uppity that day, and it came down to two of us standing. The guy that told me he hoped I'd win, and me, the guy that said, I hope I do too. I misspelled the word negate. He spelled it correctly, then spelled the word dilly-dally to win. The details are fuzzy to me. I can't remember them very well. You can see I remember them very, very well. Why am I telling you all this? I don't make, maybe, maybe the reason why is because uh, they put the story about my participation and my second place finish, they put it on the obituary page in our local newspaper with my picture there. I guess it was a symbol of what had happened to me and my attitude, crash and burn. I remember this lady in the congregation, elderly sweet sister, saw my picture on the obituary page, didn't bother to read the article accompanying it, and called my house crying, what happened to Brad, which is my real name? What do you mean what happened to him? Well, how did he die? Die? He's sitting in the living room here with us. No, the paper says he's dead. No, he's not. He's sitting right here in the living room with us. But you know what, friends? I know for a fact, and I just don't know when, but I know if the Lord lingers in heaven, is there someday going to be a newspaper with something like this in it? Bradley Joseph Clark passed from this life on such and such a date. He leaves behind the following surviving family members. He asks that all donations in lieu of flowers go to the Memphis School of Preaching. You know how it will probably read, something like that. Is your obituary going to be on the obituary page someday, yes or no? And you know what? It may be sooner than some of us think. I, I'm not trying to depress anyone, but I'm remembering some some Bible verses that uh, need to come to our mind. I know that the Bible says, what man is there that shall live and not see death? But the Bible also asks, when will I die? And gives the following answer. I don't know. Genesis 27, 2. Here's Isaac. I'm old. I know not the day of my death. I can read in my Bible in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Oh, you say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a city. We will spend a year there. We will buy and sell and get gain. He says, you don't even know what's happening tomorrow. What is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You've seen the tea kettle with the wisps of vapor coming out. How long do you see those wisps of vapor? You see them for an instant and then you don't ever see them again. Our lives are compared to that. It happens so fast. Does it seem to some of you like just yesterday you were this and now you're this? How did this happen? You know, I'm convinced that there are some of us who think that, well, we know academically, yeah, the Bible says I'm going to die, I know that, but the coffin in which my body will be placed hasn't been made yet. Really. It may be waiting in a warehouse for some family member to pick out of a catalog and say, that's the one we choose. And it may come to you much faster than any of us realize. We need to be prepared for that moment because in my future, there's going to be death. Well, what happens after I die in my future? According to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, the spirit will return to God who gave it while the body returns to the dust. And so my, I don't keep, cease to exist. I will continue to be conscious, but I will go and be somewhere else. As a matter of fact, 
In Luke 16, 19 to 31, two men died, but after they died, they were both very much aware of their surroundings. The rich man who had lived and fared sumptuously every day while on earth uh, was now in torment. Lazarus, who had been in such agony and pain that he just wanted some crumbs for food and the dogs were licking his sores, he's now in Abraham's bosom in comfort. And so uh, my spirit will continue to exist somewhere after I die. The Bible says so. And to live as Christ and to die as gain, it's far better to be with Christ, Philippians 1.21. Now here's the second thing that I know is coming in my future. There will be a resurrection in my future. You see, when I die, that's not the end of me. When I die, my spirit returns to God who gave it. One of my very favorite paintings is one I've never even seen. <laughs> you say, how is that possible? I read a description of it. In, a, in an, an article years ago, and I've looked everywhere for this painting. I know the basic gist of the painting, but I've never been able to find it. My wife is an artist, and she says she's going to reproduce it for me someday. She's even purchased the canvas upon which she plans to do it. It is a painting of, well, for accommodative purposes, we'll just call it a, a caterpillar, and it is being carried to its cocoon, and it is uh, no longer uh, there. I mean, the, what used to be inside the caterpillar is no longer there, but these, these caterpillars are dressed in black garments of grief, and they are experiencing this pain and loss, and they're taking this cocoon to its final resting place. What used to be inside that cocoon is gone. Where did it go? In the upper right-hand corner of the painting, there's a bright, beautiful butterfly. No longer confined or shackled by that cocoon, the, the confines of that cocoon. It is now taking its flight. It's free. And some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll take my flight. I'll fly away. To a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away, O oh glory. That is the promise that I've been given in the Word of God. And I know that resurrection will follow at some point in the future. After my spirit has returned to God who gave it, when he comes back, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Let me pause here long enough and notice that this is the so-called rapture passage that some of your religious friends and mine would point us to to defend the rapture. And yet the rapture, the way it's presented is, and no one's going to know what happened to all these people. They're just going to suddenly, mysteriously vanish from the planet. 207 million people were supposed to vanish from the planet back in May of 2011, it didn't happen. What, look, does 1 Thessalonians 4 sound like a secret rapture to you? Just hear it again. Does this sound like a secret? The Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. One preacher called this the noisiest verse in the Bible. There's nothing secretive about it. When the second coming happens, where those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. With whom to meet the Lord in the air? When the Lord descends from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, that's when the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. You know, John 11 is an interesting text because it's Marsh, it is the Lord speaking at the tomb of Lazarus and saying, Lazarus, come forth. I'm just curious, did anyone in this room ever get to hear Brother Marshall Keeble preach in person? I do see some hands going up. Marshall Keeble was a fascinating gospel preacher of his generation he had this inimitable way of saying things that only he could say, and they were very memorable. One of them I love, I, 
I listened to him say this on a, an album at the Fried Hardeman College Library. A young people, an album is like a big CD that we used to put a needle on and it would spin round and round and sound would come out of speakers and that's what I was listening to. And Brother Keeble said, do you know why Jesus called him by name when he said, Lazarus, come forth? Do you know why Jesus called him by name? Because if Jesus had just said, come forth, everything in the cemetery would have got up. Hmm. Do you know there's actually a verse for that? John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this. The hour is coming in the which, not just Lazarus, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. I know it's going to happen someday. There's going to be a resurrection. The Bible says so. I also know, as I noticed earlier with you, the living will be changed. Not everyone will be dead when Jesus Christ comes back. And that's why all the gloom and doomsayers who are talking about the world being destroyed in one big nuclear conflagration... I'm not saying there would never be a nuclear war. I hope there's not. But I promise you this. There'll be, according to Scripture, some will be alive when Jesus comes back. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to someday get to see Him in the air. The living will be changed in the future. And then what does the future hold? There will be a judgment day in my future. How do I know? Listen to Romans 14, 12. So then, each one of us shall give account of whom? Himself to God. We must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things we've done in the body, whether they be good or bad, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And my Bible tells me in Matthew 25, 31 to 46, that on the judgment day, Jesus is going to separate folks on his right hand and on his left. All nations will be gathered for that judgment. Have you ever been given a exemption from a final exam because you had perfect attendance during the school quarter or semester? On the day of judgment, no exemptions from the final. All of us will give account of ourselves to God. And we need to be prepared to answer for me, not for someone else. Because... On the day of judgment, it's about my personal life, not someone else's. I also know that what does the future hold? The world that I now live in, that you now live in, will be destroyed. In your Bible in 2 Peter chapter 3, there were some folks saying, where's the promise of his coming? We don't see any evidence that he's coming back anytime soon. Well, you wouldn't because there are no signs. But God then, through Peter's pen, tells them, look, the only reason he hasn't come back yet is because he's long-suffering, not because he's not keeping his promise. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come in the which... The element shall melt with fervent heat, watch, the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be? Preacher, are you telling me my dream house is going to someday burn? Yeah. My car? Yes. But not my iPhone, right? Yeah, even your phone. Not my DVD collection, yeah. But certainly not my Xbox or my PlayStation, no, yeah. Show me the material thing on earth that's never going to burn, that's going to live with you in eternity. Friends, that's why it's so foolish for us to lay up treasures on the earth because those things are going to be corrupted and destroyed. But we lay up treasures in heaven where they'll never be taken from us and we set our affection on things above, where Christ is, on the right hand of God, Colossians 3, 1, and the earlier passage was Matthew 6, 19 to 21. 
This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore because someday I'm leaving this place to go to a permanent place, either heaven or hell. The Bible teaches this. I'm going to live eternally, either in eternal life or eternal punishment. Listen to Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The Bible makes it crystal clear that you have a destiny that is going to someday be yours forever, and you'll never get out. You'll, you won't want to get out of heaven, and you'll never be able to escape. Look, the same Greek word that describes the duration of heaven is the same Greek word used in the very same passage, Matthew 25, 46, to describe the place called hell. I can't change the Bible. I wouldn't presume to change the Bible just to make somebody feel more comfortable. The Bible says what it says, and we have to live accordingly. I will live eternally somewhere in the future, and so will you. Now that raises a question. Where will that be? And am I prepared for that future? Are you prepared for that future? And as we close, I want to investigate with you Matthew chapter 25 and this parable of the ten virgins because it's all about folks that knew the bridegroom and whether they were or were not really prepared for him to come. In Matthew 25, you'll notice here that we have the parable of the ten virgins and the first thing we see in verse 1 is the wedding. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Let me give you a little background about weddings in the first century. This comes from Manners and Customs of Bible Times by James Freeman. And he writes this, he says, On the occasion of a marriage, the bridegroom, attended by his friends, went to the house of the bride and brought her with her friends, her bridal party, in joyful procession to his own house. The virgins mentioned in this text were probably some of the friends of the bride. They're in the bridal party, if you will. And they're waiting for the groom to arrive and take them to his house for the big celebration. But he's not there on the time. They didn't know exactly when he was coming And so we see this wedding, and by the way, another thing, the common Palestinian custom was for friends to stay with the bride and keep her company until the arrival of the bridegroom, at which time they were to light their lamps, go out, and make procession to the groom's house. Now, one of the laws of the day, they couldn't be on the street without a lighted lamp. So when the foolish virgins later figure out this, It's a big deal because if their lamps aren't lit, they can't make the procession. So we see them waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. Look at verse 5 for the waiting. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And by the way, don't forget that. I've heard preachers who I'm sure are well-meaning use this passage to teach against the danger of falling asleep in the service or something of that nature. Friends, I want you to notice how many of the virgins, according to the text, not according to the picture on the wall, how many of the virgins, according to the text, slumbered and slept? How many? They all did. But for some reason, this artist has only depicted five slumbering and sleeping. As if the foolish virgin's problem was they fell asleep. No, that wasn't the problem. They all slumbered and slept. The danger is not falling asleep. The danger is falling asleep unprepared and waking up without time to make it right. That's what the danger is. And so look at this waking in verses 6 and 7. At midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom's he's, he's arriving, he's coming. Go out to meet him. 
And so how many of the virgins arose from their slumber? All of them. How many of the virgins trimmed their lamps? All of them. And that's when the waning is discovered. The foolish virgins see their oil is waning. They said to the wise, give us of your oil. Our lamps are, King James says, gone out. Most literally in the original language, are going out. But there is this plea, This you can see them in the big pl- clamoring, please will you give us some of your oil so that we can furnish our lamps with oil and have them lit and make the joyful procession with you. But you see now a withholding. Look at verse 9. But the wise answered saying, not so. We can't give you some of Lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and watch. Buy for yourselves. It's individual preparation. It's not group. I, we don't get in on the group plan on the day of judgment. Well, I was a part of that group, Your Honor. I was a part of that group. No. That's not going to work. The Bible tells us that we have to be ready individually and buy for ourselves. And so, the wise, according to verse number 3, had, or verse 4, had taken oil, extra oil, in their vessels with their lamps. This was smart. Advanced preparation. The foolish had not done so. So here they are. They're all waiting together for the same event. But uh, look at verse 10 for the welcoming. But while they went to buy, while the foolish virgins are off trying to get their last minute emergency oil, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. And the tense of the verb here indicates it wasn't going to be opened again for that event. Now, I used to work at Burger Chef in Indiana. I don't know if y'all had Burger Chefs over here in Ohio or not, or whether there are still any remnants of those left anywhere. But that's where I worked in high school. I loved 10 o'clock because the manager would say, Clark, lock up. And I'd go lock the doors. And then I'd start wiping tables down, sweeping and mopping. And as soon as I'm done with that, I can go home. On more than one occasion, we've locked the doors and a car pulls in the parking lot. They see the interior lights on and assume we're still open. Uh, If I had some video back then of some of the facial expressions of people walking so confidently to the door and pulling on it, fully expecting it to open so they could come inside and order whatever they had on their minds... I could probably make some money with some of those videos if I just had them. But here's what happened. This guy pulls on the door, fully expecting it to open, and when it doesn't, he looks at his watch, then looks at the door, the hours listed, and then looks at me. Yes, sir. Are y'all closed? And that's when you want to say what you shouldn't say or can't say Uh, yes this guy do you have anything in the warming bin that I could buy that you're going to throw away anyway you wouldn't have to dirty any new dishes is there anything you're going to throw away I could just buy that let me let me ask my manager he wants to know if he can buy something okay okay Uh, sir I'm sorry we're closed This one fellow said, I just want a drink. Can I just come in and get a drink or can you hand it to me out the door? I'll pay you right here. I said, let me ask my manager. He wants to know. I'm sorry, sir, we're closed. The door was shut for the day, for the night. Guess what? At 6 a.m. the next morning, that door is going to swing wide open again and you can come in and get anything you want off the menu. You've got another chance. When this door was shut, there wasn't another chance There was a welcoming of the five virgins who were prepared, who had taken oil in their vessels with their lamps, and they are welcomed right on in. But now there's a wailing in verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, 
Lord, open to us. You can almost hear them knocking at the door. Open the door, please. We're here now. We have our oil now. Open the door. But he answered and said in verse 12, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I don't recognize you. What do you mean? We're, we're part of the bridal party. How could you not know us? We were right there with the other virgins that were waiting for your arrival. And we all were waiting for the same event. Let me ask you a question tonight. We have more than 10 people here in this room. Is there a sense in which all of us are waiting for the same ultimate arrival of the bridegroom? Yes or no? Are we all waiting for the same event in the long run? Yes. Yes. Does being together in the same group waiting for the same thing guarantee we're all ready just because we're hanging around other folks who are? Not necessarily. These five foolish virgins were not ready and just because they were hanging around people that were didn't make that somehow trickle down to their readiness. No, they needed to be ready individually. You can't get in on the group plan. The door was shut, and what a sad, sad thing that was for those five virgins. And so picture them taking turns knocking at the doors. Come on, please open. Will you open the door? We're here now. We have our lamps lit, trimmed and bright. What's the, es- the lesson for you and me? You look at verse 13. Watch, the watching. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Have you ever heard someone predict when the Lord was going to come back? I have a preacher friend who was listening to AM radio station, and this denominational preacher was on this program, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I've done the mathematical calculations, I've looked at all the prophecies of Holy Scripture, and I'm telling you right now, after my investigation, I can tell you with absolute certainty, three weeks, the Lord's coming back in three weeks, mark it down, you can take it to the bank, get ready, in three weeks the Lord will be here. He went on like this for 28 minutes. At the end of his broadcast, his announcer came on and said, if you really enjoyed this message and you'd like a personal copy of it, write to us at this address and please allow four to six weeks for delivery. (laughs) Now, what? I think somebody missed their own sermon. Guess what? Three weeks came by and went and no, the world didn't end. Can I say something to you that I know you've heard preachers say long before this one? Is it possible the Lord could come back in three weeks, yes or no? Is it possible that he could come back in three hours, yes or no? Is it possible that he could come back in three minutes, yes or no? Is it possible, I'm only asking about possibilities, is it possible the trump could sound in the next three seconds. Does that mean because three seconds just came and went and it didn't happen that it never will happen? No. It's going to happen someday. Do we need to be afraid for it to happen? Do we need to be running? Oh, no. The Lord's coming back. What are we going to do? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. No, friends, Did these five wise virgins have confidence when they heard the bridegroom's coming? They were, okay, we've made preparations. This is a wonderful moment. And we don't need to look at the second coming as, oh no, what am I going to do? But, oh yes, look who I get to meet Look who I get to live with. I get to go be with them forevermore. This is the very thing I've lived my life for, to live with him. Yeah. I want to close out by using an illustration that I use at just about the end of every gospel meeting I'm privileged to hold if it's, if it's the first one that I'm ever able to hold at a congregation. Before I use it, I, I want to say something to you about the joy of readiness. 
And the reason why it's on my mind is this little storm that we're having, the shower and the, some of the thunder, it takes me back to Indiana days when I was in high school and I'm just going to level with you. I'd been well taught by a mom and dad that loved the Lord and loved his word and I knew what it was, but there was a time when I was for a small slice of time in my high school years living as a double agent. Oh, I'd be pious and holy and righteous at church services but I wasn't acting that way around certain friends at school. And I knew I was wrong. And there I am in my bed that night in Noblesville, Indiana. And the storm that raged through that night shook that house so violently I could hear the windows rattling. And I thought the wind's about to pick this house up and carry me into eternity. And I started praying. And I remember even saying, God, please don't let me forget this prayer if the sun is shining tomorrow. And I'm not saying I've lived a perfectly mm -hmm. sinless life since then, but I've not been through the hypocritical stage of just pretending since then. I, I realized I needed to be sincere and genuine. I don't know when the Lord is coming back. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will happen during a thunderstorm when it, everything seems so ominous. As in the days of Noah, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, doing normal everyday things. And there's no reason to believe that there's going to be some kind of ominous event that's, oh no, the Lord's about to come back. No, we'll be doing everyday ordinary things and so when he comes, the sun might be shining with a beautiful, beautiful blue sky and wonderful breeze like we had here the other day. What if the Lord comes back then? Will I be ready then? My mom and dad, ironically, coincidentally perhaps is the better word, when I was in high school came to me and said, son, someone in Ohio has passed away and we need to go be with a family. You've missed a lot of work lately and we don't want you to miss any more. We know you probably are coming close to getting in trouble for missing so much lately. So we're going to leave you here for the first time ever on your own. And I don't know when we'll be back, son. If we get over there and they need us to stay an extra day, then we'll stay an extra day with them. I just don't know when we'll return. And not knowing when they were going to return, I made this pledge in my mind. I'm going to keep this place in apple pie order so that no matter when I hear the garage door start going up, I'm like, okay, I'm not panicked. This place is not a mess. There's nothing in here I have to clean up that I wouldn't want them to see. And I slept and slumbered peacefully. And when the garage door finally did start coming up and they arrived home, I wasn't frightened. I was happy to see them and I wasn't ashamed for them to walk in the door and see the place as it was. I wasn't scrambling to make last minute preparations. Do you know one reason why God may not have told us when he's coming back? Because there are some folks, if they knew exactly when he was coming back, who would frankly wait till the last minute to try to get ready for it. And he deserves much more than that. And so how do I stay ready? Well, I get in Christ. That's the safe place. You know, one of my favorite verses, 1 John 2, 28. Now little children, abide in him so that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If I get into him, that's where salvation is. 1 John 5, 11 says eternal life is in his son. Salvation's in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2, 10. As a penitent confessing believer, I am baptized into Christ to put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. And thus I access the salvation of Christ and I become a member of the church that belongs to Christ. And I can now live for Christ so that someday I can live with Christ. That's it. That's what life's all about. And to show you what life is all about as I close, this is that illustration I was telling you that I end every gospel meeting with. 
And it's not original with me, but it's very thought-provoking. Every time I tell it, I think about it too as it relates to me where I am on the timeline. Family calls their son in for a little pre-graduation talk. Look at you in your cap and gown. Oh. You were in the sandbox yesterday playing with your toys and riding your big wheel up and down the driveway. And now look at you all grown up in your cap and gown. You look very handsome. But where did the time go, son? We, your mom and I just want to have a brief talk with you before we leave for your graduation. After you graduate tonight, what's next on life's agenda for you? The boy looks a little puzzled. Well, you, you all know what's next. I, I know, son. Just you humorous. Talk it through with us. Next on life's agenda after I graduate is, well, I go to college. I'm going to college. I'm going to get my degree. Maybe I'll meet that special someone while I'm in school, and I'll start my career and maybe get married and start my family. That would mean grandchildren. That's sweet. Okay, son, let's say God lets you live long enough to go to college, get married, start your career, have children. I have grandchildren. Then what? What's next on life's list? Big list of things to do. I raise the children, work my way up the company ladder, I guess, to try to do the best I can to provide for my family and I guess about the time I do all that, my children will be graduating. Oh, to see my grandchildren graduate, that would be sweet, yes. All right, let's say you live long enough to have children who grow up and they graduate, then what? What's next, son? Uh, by the time my children are graduating high school, I guess they'll go off to college, start their families, their careers. I'll become a granddad. Ah. Uh, that means I'll be a great granddaddy. Okay, good, good, good. Let's say you and I both live long enough for that to happen. Then what's next, son? Well, I mean, by the time my children are having children, I guess I'll be getting closer to retirement age. So I guess eventually I'll retire. I don't know how many years of your retirement your mom and I'll be around for, if any, but that, that'll be sweet. All right, let's say God lets you live long enough to retire. Then what? What's next, son? I enjoy retirement, okay? And then what? I, I mean... I enjoy retirement. Now, what's next after that? Well, I mean, eventually, I guess. I guess I'll die. And with tears in his eyes, his father says, Yes, son, you will. We all will. But then what? What comes next after that? And that is the reason why this gospel meeting was even scheduled because folks are trying to get folks ready for the then what. And I know the invitation song is about to be sung, and I know that it would take courage to respond and to get your then what taken care of, but my friends, you will not regret it. As a penitent confessing believer who's baptized into Jesus Christ to become a member of the church of Jesus Christ, that would be the sweetest thing you could do to, to end your day. And you go to bed tonight and say, if the then what is now, I'm okay. If he comes back now, I'm okay. if I have an aneurysm that I don't even know I have that sends me into eternity because it pops, I'm okay. I don't want to live in fear. I want to live so that whenever my then what comes, so what? I'm ready. I'm ready. 
and the song is about to be sung, don't let anything hinder you from taking care of your eternal business right now. As together we stand and sing, won't you please? When I might fall, give me the strength to hear your call. 